In the buying and selling business, basically procurement and supplies, you need to understand the legal issues that relate to the formation of contracts. My assumption is that uh, as far as this is concerned, okay, you're either going to be the buyer, okay, so you could be that or you could be the supplier, or in fact, you could be playing both roles. There are three broad topics you need to understand, and these are the documentation that comprise a commercial agreement for the supply of goods or services, the legal issues that relate to the creation of commercial agreements with customers or suppliers, and then compare types of contractual agreements made between customers and suppliers. Now in this case, we start with the first one, which is the documentation that comprise a commercial agreement for the supply of goods or services. As we do that, okay, as we go through that, our area of focus is going to be invitation to tender or request for quotation, specification, key performance indicators, that is KPIs, contractual terms, and pricing and other schedules. As you go through all that, okay, those, those are things that you're going to cover. Now, by the time you're done with all that, you should be in a position to answer the following questions. What are the four basic questions at the heart of contract law? What documents may be used to define the buyer's requirements? List details that will typically appear in an RFQ. Distinguish between open tendering and selective tendering. Distinguish between conformance specification and performance specification. What are the advantages of performance specification compared to a conformance specification? What are the objectives of supplier performance appraisal? List benefits of KPIs as a performance measure. Distinguish between a condition and a warranty. What is a model form contract? And what is a non-disclosure agreement? All of that, okay, those are things that uh, you'll be able to, you know, answer. Those are questions you'll be able to answer. Those are things you'll be able to talk about when you're done with this. Okay, look, so as you're going through this, I just want to point out that uh, you can actually go to the website, zretnetwork.com forward slash courses. The link is in the description. And uh, you can check out not only this video, you can check out other videos as well, other video lessons. And the interesting part is that as you're going through that, you also get to undertake some practice exercises, okay, based on what you've just learned. And uh, at the end of the day, once you're done with the exercise, you can submit, you know, check the details, see which questions you got right, see which questions you got wrong. And if you think, okay, let me redo this entire thing, just click, you know, restart the course and, and take all that, you know, and, and redo that again, okay? So the point is, um, you're trying to make the learning experience as comfortable and as realistic as possible. So you go through a lesson, you test yourself, so you can do that. Anyway, let's continue the video. A contract is a legally binding agreement or a promise that is enforceable by law. According to Sir William Anson, a contract is an agreement enforceable at law made between two or more persons by which rights are acquired by one or more to acts or forbearances on the part of the other or others. Um, you know, in, in your day-to-day -day life, okay, contract forms a big role of all the sort of commercial uh, agreements you get into. Okay, it could be anything: buying a car, buying a house, buying airtime, you know, for your phone, all that stuff. There is some sort of contract that is at you know is at work when you're doing all those things. Now, the legally binding aspect is the key difference between social sort of agreements and uh, contractual agreements. The law of contract is concerned with four basic questions. Number one, is there a contract in existence? Now, the answer to that will obviously depend on um, whether the essentials for a valid contract were actually in place. We're talking about things like whether there was a valid offer followed by valid acceptance, and uh, then the parties provided consideration. And even, you know, if the parties did all that, the question still remains, were the parties of a capacity to contract and did they intend for legal consequences to follow? Now, those are some of the things that will actually answer that question. Uh, the second question is, is the agreement one which the law should recognize and enforce? You see, you can have any sort of agreement you want, okay? But in order for the law to enforce agreements, those agreements which are actually going to turn into contracts have to be valid. So a contract can be valid, there is a contract that can be enforced by law. A contract can be voidable. 
which is a contract. First of all, a contract can be void, which is pretty much the opposite of valid. That is, it cannot be enforced by law. Now, void contract is not the same as an illegal contract. I mean, there is a technical difference. And then a contract can be in between valid and void, which makes it voidable. So that is a sort of contract that if something happens, something changes, okay, as far as the behaviors of the parties is concerned, then that contract switches from void to valid, or it switches from valid to void. Well, for the most case, for the most cases, it you know it will be from void to to valid. So that answers that question. Now, number three: When do the obligations of the parties come to an end? Because a contract, or the most contracts, in fact, all contracts will have an exit an exit clause, which is important. Uh, number four. What remedies are available for the injured party if the other party fails to meet its contractual obligations? That is something else that also has to, has to be brought about in that contract. I mean, it's, it's part of uh, contract law. If I am supposed to supply something, okay? So you've paid me to supply, I don't know, laptops or whatever it is. Now, I have a contractual obligation to do that. And then if I supply, okay, you pay or you've already paid and therefore you need to supply. Then the question becomes, what if I fail to supply? What remedies do you get? Or what if I supply and then you fail to pay? What are the remedies available to me? These are things that the contract will, or the contract law is interested in answering. Why? Because they sort of become part of the issue of what happens if a contract is breached. All right. Offer and acceptance are the focus of a contract. Uh, meaning what? Meaning... The seller makes an offer to sell, which, if accepted by the buyer, establishes an agreement. Or the buyer offers to buy, which the seller accepts in order to establish the agreement. Which means what? Which means that's pretty much it. Either way, one party has to make an offer and the other party has to accept that offer in order for a contract to start to come alive. In either cases, it should be clear that a key requirement for a valid and workable commercial agreement is the clear statement and accurate alignment of exactly what the buyer wants and what the supplier is offering or agrees to supply. So the question then becomes, how do you, you know, exactly how do you communicate the requirements? And the buying organization has to do that, okay? So the buying organization has to ensure that their requirements are properly communicated to the supplier. So if you're the one who's buying, remember, I can only supply what you want if I already know what you want, because otherwise I can supply something and then it turns out to be what you don't want. And that just puts us in a rather awkward position as far as the contract is concerned. In case of a rebuy, for example, detailed description may already exist, but for a new modified procurement, they may have to be drawn up in the form of specification of various types, several level agreements, which could be added to the specification, contract terms, or even key performance indicators or performance measures which will be used to establish whether the requirements have been met satisfactorily. So that is the thing, okay? Those are some of the ways in which we try to communicate whatever it is that we want uh, so that the supplier can meet those. So you just don't straight up get into a contract. There has to be some sort of communication so that I know what you want because part of knowing what you want uh, will help to create the terms as far as the contract is concerned. Also, if you know what I'm willing to supply, the supplier, that is also important. Now, quotations, okay? Quotations are typically used when price is pretty much the only variable that we are interested in as far as the business transaction is concerned. The idea behind quotation is that the buyer describes what they wish to buy and the supplier offers the price at which they are willing to supply it for. But if you're going to use a quotation, the one thing you have to remember is that since price is the big factor in this case, then other things are going to be missing, which means if you create a contract, you will have to discuss those other things. Things like delivery terms, you know, things like quality, things. The point is, quotation only shows the price. So somebody says, I'm willing to sell um, something, I'm willing to sell you know, an item for X amount. And then you're like, yeah, yeah, we like to buy it for minus whatever. But then the question becomes, what about delivery? What about quality? What about maintenance? All these are things that you're going to have to f actually discuss since 
the quotation is not going to show any of that. Often this is how you end up with the battle of forms, something which you shall look at later, obviously. When is it advisable to use quotations? Well, for low value, low risk purchases, where the specification and delivery terms are fixed, where suppliers have been pre-qualified, where a framework or dynamic purchasing system has locked down the contract terms, and price is the only variable. One of the ways that you can actually deal with a supplier is to send out inquiry, which can take the shape of request for quotation, request for information, or even request for proposal. Of course, that means that suppliers can also just go ahead and send you unsolicited proposal, okay? Suppliers can just send out, you know, a proposal. They, they, they don't have to wait for you to, to send that. So those are some of the ways in which parties can start getting information from each other, which will lead to a business agreement in the form of a contract. A typical RFQ form will require the following. The contact information of the purchaser, a reference number to use in reply and a date by which to reply, the quantity and description of goods or service required, the required place and date of delivery, the buyer's standard terms and conditions of purchase, as well as terms of payment. Uh, after that, the supplier will then be invited to submit a proposal or, or a quotation, okay, for that. Now, um, a typical way to evaluate the quotation, okay, that, that, that a supplier has, you know, submitted will include the following. On a comparative or competitive bidding basis, in which case the best value wins, okay? So in that case, that is pretty much what you're doing. And number two, as a basis for negotiation with the preferred supplier. So what is going to happen here is that you look at all these quotations that have been provided, okay? So you have like five or ten. And then you pick the one that you think is good and you use that as a way to negotiate with that supplier and see if you can land a deal that you want. Now, another way to evaluate the quotation will be in the form of as a way of testing the market to see what the current market price is. In cases where there are a lot of variables other than price, okay? So there are a lot of other things that you are interested in aside from the price, then tenders become a good idea. Such situation will include complex project, high value, high risk purchases, or even projects where quality and price need to be assessed. So in some cases, the organization will need to use a more formalized competitive bidding. So, you know, that's a tender, right? And this is where invitation to tender comes in. In which case, the organization will look at uh, the bids and then select the supply with the best proposal or the lowest price. Tendering can be defined as a purchasing procedure whereby potential suppliers are invited to make a firm an offer of the price and terms on which they will supply specific goods or services, which on acceptance shall be the basis of the subsequent contract. Okay, to simplify that, when we talk about tenders, I'm just talking about a situation in which suppliers put themselves forward and are hoping to be awarded a contract. So the best supply is obviously going to be awarded the contract. That is pretty much what happens in tendering situations. So in a tendering process, there are several approaches to tenders and they include open tendering, in which case the invitation is widely advertised and uh, all potential suppliers are free to, to apply. Okay, so that is open tendering. And number two, we have selective tendering, where we pre-qualify suppliers and uh, then we select a few, maybe three to ten. And those are the ones that we ask to submit their tender bids. And from there, we select the one that you want to work with. And uh, then you can also have a third option, which is restricted open tenders. So the restriction in this case can be through the form of communication you choose. So it sort of is open, but then we sort of limit it, we restrict it to a certain form of communication. Maybe you advertise that one through our website alone. So it's open, yes, but it's only open to the people who saw it through our website. And those are the ones who end up applying. So let's talk about the steps involved in the tendering process. Now, when it comes to tendering process, we have number one, preparation of the proper tender and contractual document. By doing this, it will help to ensure that the bidding process is accurately costed, 
directly compared and all requirements are complied with. Now the second step will be advertisement of the required procedures to be followed throughout the, the entire process and timetable for expression of interest or submission of bids. The third one is sending out pre-qualification questionnaires. Now the pre-qualification questionnaires are important because if you are using a selective tendering as, as a method, then it means based on the way people answer these questionnaires, then from there we choose the person who we think is actually qualified to, to undertake the, the tender or the persons who are qualified to move on to the next stage of the tender. Uh, it's not, we don't, remember, pre-qualification doesn't mean that the people who pass the pre-qualification process get the tender. No, they're just being pre-qualified so that they can move on to the phase where they can actually submit their, their tender bids. So number four, issue of invitation to tenders. So these are the situation where, this is the situation where now you get the documents that you sign or you fill in so that they become part of your bid. Tender documents would normally include an invitation to tender and instruction to tenderers, pricing document, the specification, criteria for award, conditions of purchase, as well as deadline for submissions. Number five, tenders should be issued to each potential supplier in identical terms and by the same debt. Number six, tenders or offers will be received in the form of sealed bids for opening by tender evaluation team. So at this point, what is happening? The potential suppliers have already uh, sort of submitted their bids. They've, they've, they've met the requirements that are required during the invitation uh, for tender based on whatever we did put out as part of our expression of interest. So now the tenders have been submitted in the form of sealed bids and then you're going to have a tender evaluation team who will open. Usually it depends. In case of public procurement, these are a very open process where we have representatives who actually sit there to see that the bids are not tampered with. You know they're being opened, and everybody can say, "Yep, that that seemed to be have been seemed to have been a fair process." Now the next thing that happens is post tender clarification, verification of supply information, or negotiation where required. And of course, in some in some places, this is not even allowed. So it sort of just depends which country you come from. In some countries, you just open the bid, and that's it. You add a contract. But uh, usually these were something like post-tendering negotiation takes place. And usually it's like, okay, so these are much you're willing to work for. Can you? And then it's like, no, we can't. And so you add the contract, which is the next stage anyway. Number next, contract will be awarded and the award communicated to the tenderers. Now there is something that uh, I need you to pay attention to. We, we did say that you can evaluate tenders based on the one that has the lowest price or the one that has the best value. For most people, they just tend to go with the lowest price. But there, there are other things that you need to check aside from just the price. So it's not always the case that you want to evaluate bids and then say the person who had the lowest price wins. Not really, because sometimes a lower price might actually compromise other things. It will be legally and ethically important for any invitation to tender to state clearly that, number one, the buyer will not be bound to accept the lowest price quoted. Number two, Specified non-price criteria such as environmental, social stability, or innovation will be taken into account and given a specified weight or priority in the contract award decision. And finally, post-tender negotiation may be entered into, if necessary, to qualify or clarify tenders or to discuss potential um, improvement or adjustment to suppliers' offers. That is the thing about the tendering process. Of course, you know, if you have any question, you are always free to ask. Um, specifications can be defined as statements of requirements to be satisfied in the supply of goods or services. I mean, you want something. Well, what exactly do you want? And then you list whatever it is that that thing has to, or the, the things that you expect the product or the service to, to meet or to to do, and then those can become part of your specifications. Why exactly do specifications matter? Now, in the quest of value addition, okay, you probably want to ask yourself, how do specifications fit in? Well, specifications, okay, effective specifications will help us in terms of value addition. So it's going to be your job while you're doing specification to ensure that, number one, 
requirements are properly defined and uh, this is something that you can achieve by making sure that all relevant stakeholders are on board when you're developing your specifications. Now, the second thing, communicate the requirements clearly to the supplier. This way, they can, depending on the type of procurement, conform to the plan or innovate cost-effective solutions. Because not all specifications are conformance specifications, something that we shall talk about in a few, you know. Some specifications are performance-based. It's more of, I want something that will do this, so you feel free to come up with whatever as long as it does this. But then we have others which are more of, I want this thing to be exactly the size, you know, this color, and then you can't be creative. You just have to stick to what I've told you. So conform to the specifications I've given you. Now, this, the other thing about specifications is that, so minimize risk associated with miscommunication, for instance, doubt, and then they provide a means of evaluating the quality or conformance of goods and services provided. And finally, they support standardization and consistency where items are procured from more than one source. Let's talk about types of specifications. Now, there are two main categories of specifications, okay? Or two main broad categories in which specifications fall under. And these are number one, conformance specification, which uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, in this case, the supplier has no choice but to stick to what the buyer has stated. So uh, think of it this way. If you want, um, all right, so examples of this will include things like engineering drawing, a chemical formula, model name, or even number or brand. So in that case, just stick to what I've told you. I mean, this is what I want, exactly this I want it to be. Now, the second type of specification will be performance or functional specification. In which case, the supplier, you know, you tell the supplier what you want the thing to do. And then they are free to figure out how they are going to make that thing. So like sometimes you do this with um, the, the, the creativity sort of um, persons, you know, that, that can be the case. You know, I, I want you to design a website and I want the website to do one, two, three, but then other than that, feel free to make it as interesting as possible, okay? In terms of advantages and disadvantages, here's how the two compare. Performance specification has a number of advantages such as the specifications are easier to draft. Number two, the efficiency of specification does not depend on technical knowledge of the buyer. Number three, supplier can use their creativity to develop the products. Number four, greater share of specification risk is borne by the supplier. But then the question can still be in this case, um, when then should we use uh, the performance specification? When is it advisable to use one? Because with conformance, it's, you know, but then, when, when when do you really think it's necessary or a good idea to use performance specification? Um, you could use it in situations like when the supplier has more technical or relevant skills than the buyer, uh, when technology is constantly changing in the supplier's industry, in which case it will be hard to specify methodologies. When there is a clear criteria for evaluating alternative solutions suggested by suppliers competing for the contract, and uh, finally, when there is enough time to assess the functionality of the product as proposed. Here's a quick thing. If you're going to develop specifications, here are 10 things you really need to have in mind. Number one, the purpose, okay? You must find out what you intend to achieve. Number two, stakeholders' needs, which is important because you're not going to develop anything if you don't involve... I mean, yes, you could. You could develop something without involving the parties that are going to be affected by that thing. But think about sustainability. How long do you think it will be before people say, that was never our idea anyway? So the second thing, you want to involve the stakeholders. So what is the purpose? Number two, involve the stakeholders. The third thing that you must ensure exists there is the scope of specification. You are going to have to make a choice about what to include and what to exclude from the specification. How you do this will depend on how you answer the following questions. Will the scope change during the contract? And if so, how? Are there any user training needs required? And is there any internal input needed? That is important as far as developing the scope is concerned. The fourth thing you need to have in mind is improvement and innovation. So you just don't want to recycle old specifications because that is something you can do. You can just look at what worked in a certain project, take it, edit, and then say we need this. So you 
may not really want to do that in as much as that is the easiest option. Number five, regulatory compliance and quality. You need to know what standards are to be met. For instance, national and international quality standards such as ISO, data protection, and data security. Number six, the type of specification. Is it going to be conformance? Is it going to be performance and why? Number seven, the relevance. So before you include or exclude things in the specification, you have to ask yourself how relevant such will be to your organization. Okay. And uh, now the eighth thing will be how will the performance be measured? So you ensure you have an actual monitor and evaluation performance of the specification. Number nine, clarity, which means the specification must be clear and unambiguous. And finally, service conditions. You have to take account of any impact that could be made by point of delivery itself, including things like operating and storage conditions, availability of energy, safety consideration, etc. If you have those 10 place in those 10 things in place, okay, if you have those 10 things in place, then yeah, your specifications are going to be, you know, properly done. So specifications, as we know, will set out what exactly is to be is to be delivered. The question then becomes, how do you compare what has been delivered with what was supposed to be delivered? Now, this is where KPIs come in. That is key performance indicators. KPIs are qualitative or quantitative statements which define adequate or desired performance in key areas. What gets measured gets managed. So that gives us an idea why it's important, okay? Why it's important to measure the supplier performance. Now, when you talk about supplier performance, you're talking about assessing their current performance against defined performance criteria, previous performance, as well as performance of other comparable organization. So by incorporating KPIs in a contract, okay, that is important because that is going to be one of the ways in which you can actually, um, you can actually go ahead and assess what the buying organization expects in that contract if you are the supplier. It is also a way that uh, we can go ahead and uh, assess what the supplier is supposed to do or what they have done in that particular contract. In other words, they define the business needs in terms of measurable outputs, outcome, or behaviors which indicate that the required level of performance to meet has been met. Remember, these are actually key um, elements, key components, of performance management framework. So we're talking about key performance indicators. Okay, what are you measuring? Targets, the performance levels to be achieved, as well as consequences, which means what will happen if the measures are not achieved or if they are excluded. So what are the benefits of using KPA? Well, the benefits will depend on the role you're playing in that deal. Are you the buyer or are you the supplier? So let's start by talking about the benefits of using uh, KPIs to a buyer. So some benefits of using KPI as performance measures are increased and improved communication on performance issues, creates a motivation to surpass the specified performance level, uh, supports the collaboration between the buyer and the supplier relation, helps focus on key result areas such as cost reduction and quality improvement, and finally reduces conflict that arises due to poorly defined goals. But to the supplier, okay, how is this beneficial or how are these beneficial to the supplier? We're talking about supplier, okay, so we're talking about benefits that um, will include setting clear performance criteria and expectation, managing supply risk, okay, supporting contract management to ensure that agreed benefits are obtained. Number four, providing feedback for learning and continuous improvement in the buyer-supplier relationship. But that is not to say that KPIs are just all rainbows and puppies, okay? They, they, they do have setbacks. So we're talking about things like cutting corners in quality so as to achieve productivity, as well as focusing on results at the expense of relation, which is something that you can do if you're given a target. It's like, this is what they want. All right, let's see how fast you can get to whatever they want and everything else takes a back seat. Most organizations seek to manage KPIs outside the contract, and that is not a good idea because if they're not part of a contract, then enforcing them becomes eh, not as easy as if it were when they were in that, you know, in that contract. 
So it's not really a good idea to have KPIs separate from a given contract. You need to, well, it is a good idea to include them in the contract. In agreeing to pay a given price, the purchaser expects a defined service level and or quality of goods supplied. This is the cost-benefit balance which has been achieved through a tender process or negotiation. Which means, in that case, if the KPIs are not part of that contract, then it can be difficult to exactly measure the performance because it will be like, yeah, well, you paid me to deliver this thing and I've delivered it. Uh, now, as for how you wanted it to be, meh, okay? We didn't expressly talk about that. I mean, they'll probably just hide behind a clause like um, fitness for purpose, which will depend, okay, on how that purpose is defined. And there is a reason why sometimes it's a good idea to have those in a contract. A KPI is merely an indicator of level of performance. It may, for instance, show that the end user satisfaction is 85%. And that might sound like a good number, 85%. Except the number is actually pointless if you don't know the pass mark. So 85% is good or bad? Well, it depends on what you're comparing it to, which is the thing about targets. In a sector where satisfaction scores in the higher 90s are regularly achieved, 85% would be cause for concern. If market research has shown that average satisfaction rate hover around 80%, then despite the fact that you still have 15% dissatisfaction overall, your score does not look quite so bad. Therefore, whenever KPIs are set, is all you are saying, whenever you have a KPI, you also need to have targets against which to benchmark that KPI. Both indicators and targets should be developed as part of the overall contract design. In negotiated contracts, it may be possible to revisit them during the negotiation. But for tender contracts, there must be part of the original tender invitation package. So just like specifications, KPIs can have the following, you know, they can affect the following. Number one, a potential supplier's ability to actually perform the contract, e.g. they may simply not be able to resource next day delivery. Number two, a potential supplier's interest in the contract. And number three, price at which a supplier is willing to be able to perform the contract. Now, it's important to understand that uh, you don't just straight away run into a contract, okay? You normally start by talking or whatever. The point is, there are things that are said before you actually get into that contract. Those things are called representation. If, if they are true, because if they are false, they are called misrepresentation. Now, of the things that you say, some of them will make it to a contract, others will not. Those that actually make it into a contract are going to be called the terms of the contract. Meaning what? Terms of a contract are the rights and obligations of each party in the contract. The terms may be expressed, that specifically agreed upon, or implied from the party's behavior. So it is important, okay? It's important to know whether a statement is actually a term of a contract or merely a representation. In fact, look at this. So you're talking about Oscar Chess Limited v. Williams, 1957. Now, Mr. Williams purchased a second-hand Morris car on the basis that it was a 1948 model. The registration document stated that it was registered, it was first registered in 1948. The following year, her son used the car as a trade-in for a brand new Hillman Minx, which he was purchasing from Oscar Chess. The son stated that the car was a 1948 model, and on that basis, Oscar Chess offered 290 pound of the purchase price of the Hillman. Without this discount, Williams would not have been able to go through with the purchase. Eight months later, Oscar Chess Limited found out that the car was in fact a 1939 model and worth much less than thought. Now they brought an action for the breach of contract, arguing that the date of the vehicle was a fundamental term of the contract thus giving grounds to repudiate the contract and claim damages. The question then is, was the statement uh, as to the model and make of the, actually was the statement as to the make of the car a term or was it just a representation? Okay, a mere representation. 
Well, the truth is, it wasn't really a term, and here's why. So it was held that the statement relating to the age of the car was not a term, but a representation. The representee, Oscar Chess Limited, as a car dealer, had greater knowledge and would be in a position, in a better position to know the age of the manufacturer than the defendant. Which just goes to show you that sometimes when it comes to figuring out whether a statement is actually a term of a contract or a mere statement, assuming it's not written, okay? Because if it's not written, we automatically assume, I mean, if it is written, we just assume that all written stuff in the contract are going to be terms of that contract. But if it isn't written, then the court might actually look at the person who made that statement. Um, and then the person the statement was made to, who was in a better position to know what is going on. So that was the case here. But uh, compare that to this case. Dick Bentley Production v. Harold Smith Motors, 1965. Dick Bentley knew the defendant who was a car dealer specialist in the prestige market for some time. He had asked him to look out for a well-vetted Bentley car. The defendant obtained a Bentley and recommended it to the defendant. He told him that the car had been owned by a German baron and had been fitted with a replacement engine and a gearbox and had only done 20,000 miles since the replacement. Mr. Bentley purchased the car, but it developed faults. The defendant had done some work under the warranty, but then more faults developed. It transpired that the car had done nearer 100,000 miles since the refit. The question for the court was whether the statement amounted to a term, in, in which case damages would be payable for breach of contract, or whether the statement was a representation, in which case no damage would be payable, since it was an innocent misrepresentation and the claimant has also lost his right to resign due to lapse of time. What do you think? What do you think was going to happen there? Was the statement a term? Or was it a mere representation? The question then becomes, who actually made the statement? What do they know? So, this is how that one was held. The statement was a term. Okay, Mr. Smith, as a car dealer, had a greater expertise and the claimant relied upon that expertise. So, that just goes to tell you that it's not always easy to figure out whether something is a term or something is um, a representation. But, as a, as a general rule, all written things in a contract are terms of that contract. So that one you just have to know. Okay, if you're dealing with a written contract, that's pretty much how it works. If it is a verbal contract, then sometimes it's important to figure out who is saying it and how knowledgeable is that person as far as the subject is concerned. And whether the thing they are saying is a statement or it's just an opinion, because think of it this way. If um, you are looking for a room and then I say, in my opinion, I think, 20 people can fit in this room. See, that is not the same as me saying, yes, I'm sure, I'm very certain that 20 people can fit in that room. Now, the terms of a contract don't uh, carry out the same weight. Some terms are actually stronger. So the stronger terms are called conditions, okay? And uh, some terms are weak. The weaker terms are called warranties. In fact, the, the effect usually depends on uh, what will happen if you breach them. So if you breach a term and the contract is off, then definitely that was a condition. If you breach a term and the contract is not off, then that was a warranty, of, which means we have terms that are in between conditions and warranties, and those ones are called innominate terms, which can go either way depending on the context. So to understand the difference, look at this case. Madame Possard, okay, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce the name. So Madame Possard entered a contract to perform as an opera singer for three months. She became ill five days before the opening night and was not able to perform the first four nights. Spears then replaced her with another opera singer. So in this case, it was held that uh, Madame Possard was in breach of condition and Spears was entitled to end the contract since she missed the opening night, which was the most important performance, as all the critics and publicity would be based on these nights. You see, that is an example of a condition. In fact, when it comes to contracts, so conditions can be classified into two. We have condition precedent, which are conditions that have to be met before the contract can start. So it's like, um, yes, I'm hiring you to build this house, but the contract can only start if we have the local council permit or the city council permit to do something. So you see, 
getting the permit becomes a condition precedent for the contract to take off. Now then we have a condition subsequent, which is a condition that if it occurs as the contract continues, then it can end the contract. For example, um, you know, your ability to live here depends on whether you can pay rent. So the moment you stop paying the rent, then that's pretty much it. I mean, it sort of depends on the sort of arrangement you have. But in this case, you, are, you only continue to be here as long as you can pay. The day you stop paying, that is the day you cease being part of this transaction. So that becomes a condition subsequent. But we also did say that we have warranties. Now regarding warranties, warranties are weak terms, okay? So here's an example of how that works out. Bettini agreed by contract to perform as an opera singer for three months period. He became ill and missed six days of rehearsal. The employer sacked him and replaced him with another opera singer. The question here is, he was supposed to perform for three, three months, right? But he missed six days of, um, of, of rehearsal. So does that mean he breached a strong term or a weak term? And the answer is, well, it was a weak term because he, you know, could have still performed. I mean, assuming he was only ill for six days and then he was good. Okay. So in this case, it was held that Bettini was in breach of warranty and therefore the employer was not entitled to end the contract. Missing the rehearsal did not go to the root of the contract. Now, remember, both conditions and warranties in a contract can be expressed or they can be implied. I mean, expressed means you can specifically talk about them or write them. All right. So all written terms are expressed terms. But then you have some terms that are derived from your behavior. Those are implied terms. It's like if you're always buying the same thing from a shop, bread. So the next day you show up and uh, the guy just looks at you and gives you bread and they take money. So it's implied that by being there, you just want bread. Which may not really be the case. But that is an example of how you can imply um, a term from someone's behavior. Of course, if there is any question as you're continuing, you know, you have to ask. You just, just don't sit there and uh, be quiet with your question. Well, since, you know, drawing contracts is going to be time consuming and uh, a lot of resources are involved, some organizations choose not to go through the contract drawing process every time they get into a deal. So what do they do? They rely on standard terms. Each firm will draw up its own standard terms of business and will seek to ensure that these terms are accepted by other firms with whom they deal. Such terms can commonly be published in organizations' purchase orders, order of acknowledge, as well as invoice and receipts. Standard terms will almost always not work in more complex or strategically critical, high-risk, non-routine business deals. In such cases, the organization will invest time and effort in actually creating a contract. Now. Um, something like a model form contract is important. These are contracts that are actually published by third parties and the organization just end up relying on them. Advantages of using standard and model form contracts will include, number one, they help reduce time and cost of contract development. Number two, can be reused in various contexts. Number three, they help reduce negotiation time. Number four, they are designed to be fair to both parties. But they also have disadvantages. So we're talking about things like the terms may not be advantageous as they would have been if the contract was negotiated. Again, the terms may be missing protective special clauses. Number three, legal advice is still required in amending them. And finally, the cost of training buyers on how to use them may be high. Right, so when it comes to um, <clears throat> how contracts tend to look like, many contracts, although not all, will usually have a format that looks like this. They have the articles, the recital, contract particular sections, the full terms and conditions, as well as the schedules. Here's how that looks like. Now the articles, okay, this will comprise a very basic agreement, okay, so you have something like this. Party A, e.g. the purchaser, is entering into a contract with party B, e.g. the supplier. Party B agrees to provide goods or services and party A agrees to pay for them. So they set out who exactly are the parties by their full, um, well, legal way of identifying them, okay? 
Usually registered company names and registration numbers may be applicable and their registered office address. And uh, in most cases, in fact, it's a good idea. In most cases, they'll also give out uh, names or terms, basically names by which the party is going to be known throughout the contract. So it could be something like the purchaser, the client, the supplier, the service provider. Or sometimes they could just shorten the name of the company. So like Zerite Network and then they just say Zerite. Okay. So, you know, that's something that can happen there. Number two, the recital. Now, these will provide context. Okay. They, 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 it sort of provides the context around which everything is happening. So we're talking about something like a very simple restatement of facts that the purchaser wants to acquire X and the supplier has agreed to provide it. In some contracts, particularly building contracts, there will be a number of other factual statements covering who will perform what roles necessary for the contract work. By convention, they start with the word whereas, which means given this, or followed by it is now hereby agreed or something similar. If anything in the recital is wrong, it could undermine the whole contract. Number three, contract particular section. So with some sort of contracts, like the industry standard contracts, those ones will have a contract particular section. This sets out some of the specific variables, such as the required date of completion and uh, any specific insurance requirement. It is a mechanism for writing terms and conditions without having to amend clause by clause. It works by creating a schedule of common variables, which can be filled in and to which the detailed terms refer back. And number four, we have the full terms and condition. So discover the if, buts, maybes, and what will happen in respect of X if ABC happens to Y. And finally, we have the schedules. This set out project specific detail either as designed by the purchaser, e.g. the KPIs, or as submitted by the supplier, for example, pricing. When we talk about uh, schedule in a contract, we're simply talking about an appendix, okay? An appendix to the body of the contract form. Schedules are used as a way of making it easier to incorporate project-specific information in a contract without having to amend the wording of the main body of the document clause by clause. So it allows, you know, standardization of the terms. That way you can just refer to them rather than having to write the entire thing each time you want to talk about it. The benefits of this approach are as follows. Number one, drawing a contract is simplified and therefore quicker and more effective. Number two, within the purchasing organization, clauses or similar contracts have identical wording, avoiding the risk of different approach across the organization. Three, contract managers become familiar with the forms that they use regularly in the event that they need to refer back to the contract they can do so with ease, knowing where to find relevant information. Of course, this is just going to be true to both the purchaser and the supplier. And uh, finally, the contract and the procurement documents can be drawn up in such a way as to allow direct incorporation of supplier's tendered offer, reducing the risk of misinterpretation. Now, let's talk about pricing schedules. So any contract that does not involve a single pricing, okay? by the end of the contract, as in prices seem to could change or something like that, we'll have a pricing schedule. This will effectively set out how the price is to be calculated for each invoice. It may include various rates, simply confirming the total fee and the proportions payable at key stages. The degree of complexity in the pricing schedule will vary hugely depending on the nature of the contract. Um, so a contract may contain some something like this. Okay, so this is an example of a fairly straightforward pricing schedule. The price of the goods and or services shall be as stated in the appended pricing agreement, Schedule A. No increase will be accepted by the buyer unless agreed by him in writing in advance of delivery or performance. And then the pricing schedule may now include uh, things that were agreed on either in agreement or negotiated on. So talking about things like the terms of the pricing agreement applied to the contract, for example, fixed price, incentive contract, or cost plus or cost reimbursement agreement, 
the supplier's schedule of price, fee, and charge, or agreed fee and charges, the pricing mechanism to be used in calculating the price if the price is to be determined by the supplier's cost, labor hours, and so on, the formula or indices to be used in assessing the supplier's claim for price adjustment or contract price adjustment clause, incentive payments or gain sharing formula to be used to reward the supplier for attainment of cost saving or other specified KPIs, price related penalties for non-performance e.g. late payment penalties, agreement on pricing installments or stage payments where relevant. Those are, that's just as far as price is concerned. But uh, we also have other common schedules. We're talking about things like specification, preliminary contracts or operational matters, performance management framework, site list, maps and plan, health and safety, um, codes of conduct, data management and all that. Now look, all that was part of us ensuring that you're in a position to understand the legal issues that relate to the formation of a contract and specifically that, that is a broad idea but specifically uh, the idea was to ensure that you actually know or understand the documentation that can comprise a commercial agreement for the supply of goods or service in doing so we we, we were specifically focusing on the following invitation to tender or request for quotation specification key performance indicators basically kpis contractual term, pricing, and other schedules. If you do have a question, okay, and, uh, you know, don't just sit there with your question. Make sure you ask. And, yeah, I'll see you in the next video.